Aren't you going to give the Macho King his title match? Just say yes to me. That's all I want from you. That is all I want from you, warrior. And welcome back to Retro Wrestling Games Presents. I'm your host, Lex G. And with me today is my longtime personal friend, Michael Swanson. How are you doing this evening, Michael? I'm fantastic. How are you doing? I'm pretty good, pretty good. Can't complain one bit. So tonight's episode will be the WWF Royal Rumble for the Super Nintendo slash Super Famicom. The version that you're watching is the Super Famicom version, which is the exact clone of the Super Nintendo version. There's no differences. Both games are completely in English as well. Uh, just that the Famicom version was cheaper, so I bought that one instead. Now, WWF Royal Rumble was released by LJN in 1993 for the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Again, this is a WWF licensed game, and it has different types of matches, including the newly added Royal Rumble Hence the name Royal Rumble. Just thinking about this game that each version, so the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo version, have five exclusive playable characters. And we'll get into that when we talk about the rosters. This game has a couple of new features, including an on-screen grapple meter, the use of steel chairs, and illegal tactics like choking and eye rakes. The Royal Rumble has a tug-of-war style grappling system where we basically get in a grapple. You button mash until you win, and then you pull off a maneuver. What a maneuver. So the different types of matches that are in this game, they have the one-on-one -on -one match, they have a tag team match, they have a brawl match, they have tournament variations, and they have the Royal Rumble match, and a six-man tag team match as well. So they have a six-man tag team match and a Royal Rumble match. The six-man tag replacing the Survivor Series style match from the year before. So I wish they kind of kept that because I like that feature where you pin guys and they get eliminated. The Royal Rumble in this particular game, you know, begins with two wrestlers that the normal Royal Rumble does. It fills up at six, so they have six wrestlers simultaneously on the screen at the same time. Additional wrestlers will enter uh, when the others are eliminated. Again, this, these matches are no holes barred, so you can use choking and eye rakes while getting disqualified. And then the last wrestler remaining after all 12 have entered the match wins the match. There's also a nice little uh, scorecard screen too, which I don't know why I use those. But it does have a handy dandy list of which opponents were eliminated by who, which is which is nice. So I find that pretty cool. I'm gonna go over the roster real fast. The two versions do share seven wrestlers. So there's Bret Hart, The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, Reyes, Ramon, Randy Savage, Crush, and the narcissist Lex Luger. The Super Nintendo version features Ric Flair, Mr. Perfect, Ted DiBiase, Yokozuna, and Tatanka. The Genesis version has Hulk Hogan, IRS, Jim Duggan, The Model, and Papa Shango. So guys, one of the things I like to do is kind of time date these games. So based on the roster and the way the characters look on screen, I would put this somewhere in between SummerSlam 92 and right around Survivor Series 92. So obviously there's no Ultimate Warrior in the game, so it's not prior to SummerSlam. And then in January, that's when Ric Flair loses the Loser Leaves Town match to Kurt Henning. So it's in that time frame. So I won't put it right around November, Survivor Series time when this game was the time date of this game, so to speak. So, Michael, I know you saw a couple of clips of this game. What are your thoughts overall? From what I remember of it, it was actually a, a fairly fun game. Me being a button masher, my brother was always the one that had the, the talents as far as video games were concerned. Uh, it came in handy for grappling for me. It wasn't one that I played often, but I enjoyed it. This is a game that I rented frequently, you know, over a weekend um, at the uh, Blockbuster video store. That's where I went and got. <laughs> well, I rented this game. I did own Super WrestleMania. I did not own this one. I did own WWE Fraud just for some reason. I didn't own this one. Maybe I didn't get it for Christmas that year or whatever. But as a kid, I only owned about eight Super Nintendo games, and this was not one of them, um, unfortunately. But the game is super fun. I do enjoy the character models. I think everyone looks really good. You know exactly who everyone is. Everyone stands out. The colors are bright. The addition of finishing holds this game makes it so much better than WWF Super WrestleMania. Super WrestleMania was kind of always bland and vanilla. This one 
the sequel to that game definitely expanded the gameplay modes and uh, overall made a better game. The sound effects are okay. There's no music during the actual wrestling matches, but in the background, you do see Vince McMahon and Bobby Heenan yelling at each other, which is fun. This is also the first game where you can have referee bumps, so you can run into the ref or just punch him in the face. When he's knocked out, you can do illegal tactics like hitting someone with a steel chair, choking them, or giving them the old good old eye rake, so... <laughs> but I think overall, I think this is a solid wrestling game. Again, up until this point, WWF games have been disappointing. We go back to WrestleMania for the Super Nintendo, for Nintendo, all the way straight through Steel Cage Challenge, Wrestling Challenge, King of the Ring. You know, Super WrestleMania was vanilla, but it was good. And this one just takes it to the next level. So I'm really see when they jump to 16-bit consoles that wrestling games are a hell of a lot better than they were during the NES days. So anyone who knows me knows that the two gimmick pay-per-views that I enjoy the most, War Game. I think all the War Games are great except for the 1998 version, which was the the three-way War Games that was weird and stupid and was gross. The other gimmick pay-per-view that I really did enjoy uh, was the Royal Rumble. And it was one of those things that I always look forward to in January. It was always a great time. And I, that's something that I really did enjoy every year, even the, the most recent ones. So, Michael, what are your overall thoughts on the Royal Rumble? I've always loved the Royal Rumble, especially as a kid. The uh, the countdown for each participant coming in, you know, counting along with it, and then and trying to anticipate who's going to come out next. Is it going to be someone you hate? Going to be someone you love? And then just the the kind of the mystery where you don't really know who's going to win. Except for a few cases where they do kind of give it away, especially um, with what was it, Chris Benoit, yeah. Rey Mysterio, when they put them in as number one and they have to make it through, they put that angle in there, then you kind of know, that, yeah, they're probably going to last the entire way through and make it. Those two aside, it's a really cool mystery. You never really know who's going to get it. Yeah. And it's very important because it is the lead up to WrestleMania. So at Royal Rumble 90, we saw the first confrontation between the Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan. Um, which I thought was yes. uh, fantastic. They did that so well. And even the year before yes. that with Macho Man and Hogan, when Hogan eliminated Randy Savage from that uh, from the Rumble, Macho got all bent out of shape about that as well. So, so I always enjoyed those. And the first Royal Rumble was in 1988, emanating from the Cops Coliseum in Hamilton, Ontario. It was a USA special, so this wasn't on pay-per-view. Apparently, the main event was a two out of three falls match between the Islanders and the Young Stallions, which I bet tore the house down. Probably not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you also had the Jumping Bomb Angels versus the Glamour Girls, and weirdly enough, Judy Martin does a powerbomb in the match. Like, out of nowhere, where no one in WWF was doing powerbombs, so... <laughs> And that was from the ill-fated WWF Women's Tag Team Championship. So it's awesome. I love the Bomb Angels, by the way. I thought they were fantastic. I also had a uh, Ricky Steamboat versus Rick Rude match. Well, Steamboat won by disqualification, which I don't remember. Did Jake run in on that? I forget. I don't think so. That has to be. Maybe not. I'm thinking that was Steamboat's first appearance back. He might have been at Survivor Series '87. After he dropped the belt to Honky and took time off for the birth of his son. Also on this show, I had a couple of uh, non-wrestling segments. So the first one being Dino Bravo was, I think, going to bench press uh, 600 pounds. And uh, he couldn't quite get it up, but he was able to get it up with the help of Jesse the Body Ventura. The big one being, big segment being the Hulk Hogan and Andre Giant contract signing, which was the lead up to the, the February 5th edition of the main event, which led up into WrestleMania 4. Everyone knows about what happened in uh, the main event where they had the, the twin referees, the twin magic on the referees, and Andre won the belt and gave it to DiBiase. They vacated it, and then they had the tournament. And the Royal Rumble set a record at the time for being the highest-rated wrestling program on cable TV with a rating of 8.2. Let's put a little context on that. I believe last week's Raw got a 1.8, so just <laughs> trying to keep that in mind. Uh, I love it. I love it. And you mentioned, uh, Michael, about some of the surprises in the Royal Rumble. And I think one of the, one of the things I do enjoy the most is like the surprises, the kind of the guys that pop out of nowhere, like the random dudes. Yes. Like I'm watching. I think it was 1995 where Carlos Colon was in the Royal Rumble for for no reason. I'm like that's a new one. <laughs> yeah, he was in there. I'm not really sure why. <laughs> One year they had Dory Funk was randomly in the Rumble for no reason. I think at that time he was doing like he was doing like the Funkin' Dojo for him. 
and uh, he was just around. And every once in a while, especially when their roster is late, they have to bring in guys for the Rumble. Like one year they had Tenru in there for, for no fucking reason at all. Uh, I don't know why they got him, but he was there. So those are nice to see. I know a couple of years, like that, the, the surprise entrance when Triple H came back from his injury, that did it with Cena. RVD, RVD's made some appearances. Uh, Kevin Nash has made some appearances as of late. And then you had that one year when it was randomly 40 people. You remember that? That was the year Del Rio won. You know, I don't think I saw that one. Yes, because I just moved to Florida and I did not have cable at the time, so I had been out of the uh, loop with wrestling. Yeah, that was that was weird. Uh, they did a 40, a 40 man uh, Royal Rumble. Um, that that real one. Well, good for you, Alberto. You're no longer with the company, but I asked to like you. <laughs> <laughs> or have you ever seen the interview with the Ultimate Warrior and uh, Sensational Sherry during the 1991 Royal Rumble? Sensational Sherry was he feuding with Papa Shango at the time? He was. He wasn't in a feud at the time. He was. That was the Royal Rumble where he lost the belt to Slaughter, and then he was in a feud with Macho. Gotcha. So that was the lead up until the career uh, versus career match. So Sensational Sherry cuts this promo where it's like, it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to put this, but fuck it. She basically said she was going to sleep with him and do gross and nasty things to the Ultimate Warrior if she gave Macho Man a title shot. Okay. And watch, watch that promo again. It's very uncomfortable. She gets on her knees at one point. And the warrior has this weird smile on his face. And then he gets in her face and goes, No! So I'm not sure if he was saying no to Sherry's sexual advances or no to Macho Man's title match. Or both. Yeah. It could be both. And then Warrior and Slaughter has their match, and then history is made. Macho comes yep. out, hits him with like the fucking light, and then uh, Warrior makes it back to the ring, and then he hits him with the scepter. Yep. And uh, Slaughter <laughs> wins the belt. <laughs> I also do remember a, a, a promo after that where, like, Warrior said there was some sort of crystal in his head because of the scepter, and he told the doctor to leave it in and sew it up. Um, <laughs> I remember that promo. <laughs> that like, what, what I do recall. Like, what are you saying? Uh, Warrior, I told him to stitch it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a real interesting uh, Royal Rumble. Also had the uh, Teddy Bassi and Virgil versus Dusty and Dustin Rhodes, and that's the one where Virgil finally turned on DiBiase and hit him with the million dollar belt. Yes. So that was really, I think that's real influential uh, and important. Uh, Royal Rumble was 91. Hogan ended up winning that, eliminating an earthquake, which I think is the end of their feud. I think that's that's the blow off of their feud is Hogan throwing out earthquake. That's kind of sad. Well, again, I, I mentioned this on another episode that I've been watching superstars from like 1990, 1991, and you'll see that a lot. Like they build feuds that we don't see a finish of because they finish them on house shows. So on TV, like oh Tito Santana and Rick Martel are feuding and they're getting into you know. And they're doing promos and stuff like that, but you wouldn't see it on the pay per view because the pay per view was like five months away anyway. Huh. So, like, they're building, they're building, they're building, and then it seems like it's dropped. And then Tito is fighting someone else, and the model is in a feud with Jake Snake Roberts. And you're like, what the hell happened? Well, what happened was is that they went around the entire country, probably Tito going over Martel and, you know, in every city in the United States. And if you didn't see it on the house show, then you weren't going to see the ending of that feud. So again, it was super important that you went to the house shows back in the day. Yeah, because you would see a lot of clean finishes on the house shows. If you watch, you know, any of the, the old school, like from Madison Square Garden or Boston Garden, you'd see a lot more clean finishes and stuff like that. So yeah, what are you gonna do? Like the same thing with uh, Randy Savage and Bad News uh, Brown. Like that has big feud and and it seemingly went nowhere, but it ended up you know they had matches on the house show. They didn't even have matches on Saturday night's main event. They just you know, it was all of a sudden just over. Which makes watching those shows difficult and give me a headache because, you know, they're not episodic. You know, Superstars was an episodic show. WWF was not doing episodic shows until they started doing Raw, and that was in 93. Their shows were in the bubble. So, very different than, like, the Memphis show, which was episodic. You know, World Championship Wrestling, you know, 605, that was episodic. Bill Watts' TV was episodic. But WWF was not episodic at all. Like, every show is standalone. So, every show is in a bubble.
So I guess it's like if you missed four of them, you can watch one and catch up. It's kind of the deal there. So, yeah, what are you gonna do? So, Michael, do you have a favorite Royal Rumble of all time? Ooh, that's a tough one. I'm really keen with the 92 Royal Rumble, where Flair wins the championship. Everyone loves that Rumble, and it's fantastic. I, I, being a Hulkamaniac at the time, being a kid, I was a huge Hulk Hogan fan, pulling for him to win the title, get it back, and then with uh, you know Sid turning on Hogan, eliminating him, and then Flair getting the win from behind, I mean, it was... It was a fantastic finish. It set up the uh, thing with you know Sid Justice at the time and yeah. Hulk Hogan, and then it would have been nice to see the uh, the Ric Flair Hogan feud start up there, but they had other plans. So they just didn't go with it, man. It was like, but it did give us that fantastic Savage uh, Flair match at WrestleMania. It, eight, so both of their matches were fantastic. Although the Hogan Flair match in '94. For WCW, was WCW's um, highest rated uh, pay per view. Pretty sure of all time until probably Starcade '97. That doesn't surprise me at all. So it's Hogan for coming in. He was with Shaq and George Foreman was around and Mr. T was there and and you know it was fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, '92 was interesting. It was the first time that you could notice that they were piping in cheers for Hogan. So mm-hmm. if you'd watch, like, I had a tape of it, like, off the TV. So, like, they're cheering Sid Justice when he, he dumped out Hogan. Like, you know, they're booing Hogan when he dumped out Sid. But when you watch it on Superstars or you watch the network version, they changed it. So mm. <laughs> they piped in booze for Justice and then cheers for Hogan. And they, I think it's somewhere on YouTube where they actually show you the difference. So uh, <laughs> I guess, you know, Hogan's popularity was starting to wane at the time. So they had to come for it. Yeah. Also on that show, that '92 show was uh, the Piper beating the Mountie to win the icy belt, and that was Piper's first belt in WWF. Um, he had won a second one. He won tag team belts with Ric Flair later on, but that's true. But it was a big deal because he was in the Fed for so long and never had a championship belt. I mean, he did lose it to Bret Hart at WrestleMania eight, and another fantastic match. So, Great match. Yeah, that WrestleMania eight is underrated, by the way. Oh, I enjoyed WrestleMania eight. I didn't like the. Um... The main event with Hogan and Justice. I mean, the well, that shouldn't have went on last. I mean, that should have been semi. Yeah. Um, it should have been. Yeah. It should have been Savage and Flair. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. That should have culminated the whole thing, and it would have been, you know, perfect. But, but no. No. It was weird too because they weren't doing great business, but it was in the dome, and I bet you they had to give away a bunch of free tickets. Which is ironic because they did that shit all the time, and then they made fun of WCW for papering the house. <laughs> Another Royal Rumble I was fond of was the one in '94. Mm. Bret Hart and Lex Luger. Yeah. And that whole you know controversy end quote, um, which led up to WrestleMania. That was uh, ten, wasn't it? 10, yep. Yeah. WrestleMania ten. Yeah, the whole Lex Express thing didn't <laughs> didn't work out. Especially yeah. you get to the like remember the blow off was at SummerSlam prior, and that Lex Express and then Lex wins by DQ. We'll and, count out. Well, yeah, it's kind of, you're right. It's kind of. Yeah, he hits him with the, uh, the plate in his forearm and knocks Yokozuna out of the ring and wins by count. It's like he didn't even try to go out and lift him and throw him in the ring. I mean, no, it just. The thing that's off putting about that is like the celebration. Yeah. It was so weird. Like, he didn't pin him. I think he was. No, he wasn't undefeated because he lost to Hogan, but he only had that one loss. That was the Royal Rumble where. <laughs> The Undertaker went to heaven. You remember that? Yes. So the, uh, Luke is going to beat him in the casket match, and they <laughs> he, <laughs> he levitated to the top of the arena. Yes. Yeah, that was Marty Jannetty and the Undertaker get up, by the way. Ah. So there you go, Marty. Marty. That was the one where I was talking about Tenru. That was the one Tenru and Kabuki was in because Cornette brought them to Japan to uh, get rid of Lex Luger. Because they did the thing at uh, SummerSlam where Luger was no longer allowed to get a title shot if he didn't win the belt at SummerSlam. And this was the only way that Lex could get a title match. Which is an amazing yeah. angle if you think about it. Oh, yeah. Bastion Booger was supposed to be in that Rumble too, but for some reason he didn't show up. Uh, poor Bastion Booger. What are you going to do? Right up there with uh, Mantar. Yeah, that's rough, right? Yeah. 
that also that uh that ninety four show had the Quebecers versus Bret Hart and Owen Hart for the belts. And that's when Owen kicked the leg out of Bret Hart's leg. Yep. I remember that too. That was huge for me. These rumbles are very much the setup for WrestleMania. Oh yeah. Well especially in nowadays. They've really gotten into that ever since what was it? Uh ninety three was the first one where they had the winner going up against the champion yep. at WrestleMania. That was Yokozuna the first time around at WrestleMania 9. Yep. And then through that, I mean, every single time it's been. Now, what about 99 when McMahon won? They did. So McMahon won, but he fought he fought Austin in the uh, cage match at St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Oh, And if Austin yeah, won, he get, the, he get the title match. So that's, that's when uh, Big Show threw him through the cage. Yeah. Okay, that's what it was. That's set everything, everyone since then has set up the consequent WrestleMania, so it's, that's a wonderful, like, three-month period there of build-up. Yeah. I'm just going through the list of people who won Royal Rumbles, and I'm going to read them off real quick, and you're going to tell me who's the worst wrestler to ever win a Royal Rumble. <laughs> so we have Jim Duggan, John Studd, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Yokozuna, Bret Hart, Lex Luger, Shawn Michaels, Steve Austin, Mr. McMahon, The Rock, Steve Austin, Triple H, Brock Lesnar, Chris Benoit, Batista, Rey Mysterio, The Undertaker, John Cena, Randy Orton, Edge, Alberto Del Rio, Sheamus, John Cena, Batista, Roman Reigns, and Triple H. So the worst wrestler out of all those? Yeah. Worst wrestler or worst performer? Not both. As far as like actual in-ring skills, I would have to say McMahon would be the worst, but he is a phenomenal performer. Yes. Granted, that's a tough one. Other than that, maybe you know, Big John Studd. Yeah, John Studd, because they never did. I think I would go with John Studd as well, um, just yeah, for the simple did. fact that they didn't do anything with him after that. Like he just yeah. won it. And yeah. He was a guest referee at WrestleMania Five in the Andre Jake St. Roberts match, so he didn't even wrestle on WrestleMania. So that one yeah. was kind of rough. Yeah, the Bautista, when Bautista won and got booed out of the building in 2014, that was rough. Oh, then again, on, uh, what was it, 2015 when Roman Reigns won. Yeah. And everyone wanted uh, pulling for Daniel Bryan. So that was an interesting to see where they were going to, how they were going to shift things around there. And yeah, they had to give it to Rollins, so. Mm hmm. And I would say Sheamus because I have a personal disdain for Sheamus. So I don't like his work. I don't think he's any good. I don't like his character. I don't like his work. I don't know what he looks. I hate his face. So. How about his accent? That too. I can second that one. <laughs> I, I mean, he's probably a nice enough guy, and he, he works hard. I'm not gonna take that way. We just, uh, he's not my cup of tea. Put it that way. No, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. Um, like, there's no reason for me to hate him with the amount of passion that I do. There's no good reason. I understand that. Loathe him with the fire of a thousand suns. So, guys, we are officially out of time. So this has been the WWF Royal Rumble uh, for the Super Famicom. Again, overall, this game, I think, is great. I wouldn't call it a must-own, but if you do have a Super Nintendo, Super Famicom, or a clone system, and you're a big wrestling fan, I do recommend purchasing this game. I think it was great. So, yeah. So there's that. So for Michael Swanson, I am Lex G. 